welcome to a special edition of our RC Public Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Louise Bertini, the Executive Director of RC. We are pleased to have you here with us today, and of course, our speaker, Dr. Aaron Burke. Dr. Burke is a professor of archaeology of ancient Israel and the Levant, and the Kershaw Chair in the Archaeology of the Ancient Eastern Mediterranean in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at the University of California, Los Angeles. We've asked Dr. Burke to be with us today for a special tribute to our dear friend and supporter, Norma Kershaw. Norma was a steadfast and generous supporter of RC for many years and played an integral role in both the RC Orange County chapter as well as RC National. I'm sure many of you, many of you uh, watching right now knew Norma well, and we are grateful to have you with us. In that spirit, I'm pleased that we have some of Norma's friends and fellow RC Orange County chapter members here with us today who will share a few words about Norma before we dive into Dr. Burke's presentation. And I now like to turn it over to Ava Kirsch, president of the RC Orange County chapter. Thank you, Louise. Hello, everyone. Norma Kirsch was my dear friend for over 20 years. I laughed, admired, and respected her. I met Norma for the first time uh, when she was curating an exhibition about the Exodus for her Mission Viejo Temple, for which she borrowed some objects from the collection of the Robert and Francis Fullerton Museum of Art. Since then, we stayed connected and our friendship had grown. Norma kindly encouraged me when I called her my mom or my Jewish mom. And she stood up to it. When my mother passed, Norma spent time with me. She listened and consoled me. I love Norma's stories. One of those I cherish very much is about Norma's decision to pursue her education at the age of 43 after raising her two daughters, Barbara and Janet. As you may know, Norma received degrees from first Queens College City University, New York, and then from Columbia University. Several years ago, when I was spending time with Norma in her house, uh, she was sharing with me some of her memorabilia. And uh, she showed me a note that her younger daughter, Janet, wrote. And it was really charming and quite cute. Janet wrote, after Norma uh, finished her master's degree at Columbia, can I call you Ma, capital M, capital A, now? So I really found it interesting. Norma and I share the jo joy of travels. Norma enjoyed travel so much. And I witnessed how difficult it was for her when she had to give them up at certain point in her life. She told me about many of her trips, including the archeological excavations in Israel, Cyprus, and Egypt, as well as her trips to Afghanistan and the Soviet Union, for which I admired her very much. Norma and I share the passion for ancient art and history, for ancient history and archaeology, for ancient Egypt and the Near East. Together, we attended numerous events and we talked a lot about those topics. We also talked about politics. Norma's passion and knowledge were well supported by her wit and sense of humor, dry and often sarcastic. As a wonderfully entertaining speaker and prolific teacher, Norma was able to convey the importance of art historical and archeological material, which brought her wide respect and recognition, including an invitation to serve as a lecturer for the United Nations Cultural Affairs Commission Committee. She served in this capacity for more than a decade. Living in California for a very long time, Norma retained her strong New Yorker persona. I loved when she compared New York to California, particularly when she wondered why Californians had to confirm meetings after making them in the first place, something New Yorkers would never do. There's not enough time, even in a week, for the long list of my memories of Norma. But I need to emphasize one, Norma's relationships with the Orange County chapter of RC. In addition to her involvement with numerous other organizations, such as ACER or Norma was also a long time, very loyal 
supporter of RCOC, serving first on the chapter's board, board of directors and then its advisory board. The RCOC board members and I cherish Norma's wisdom, generosity, and commitment to ancient history and archaeology. Norma regularly sponsored and attended our lectures and events. And sometime around maybe 2006, she made it possible for the chapter to continue its monthly events in the newly built gorgeous Norma Kershaw Auditorium at the Bowers Museum. We did it until the pandemic started. Norma attended most of our uh, chapter's events um, and almost always sat in the same seat in the second row. We all knew that she was there in spirit when she was no longer able to attend our events in person. For her strong commanding personality and ability to touch life, lives to influence and to connect people, Norma was loved and respected. Her passing left a huge void in our hearts. She's terribly missed. It feels like she left together with the world that made her success and achievements possible. I miss her a lot. I miss her every day. And now, please let me introduce Dr. Benson Herr, Norma's very close friend, who's also a great benefactor of the California State University San Bernardino, both its Egyptology program and the museum. It was Ben who introduced me to Norma when Norma was curating an exhibition for her temple in Mission Viejo sometime about 20 years ago. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Benson Herr. Thank you all very, <clears throat> very much. I first met Norma uh, when shortly after she came to Southern California and we had recently formed the um, RC chapter in Orange County. She came to hear me give a talk on ancient Egyptian medicine. And those of you who know Matt, knew Norma can understand that after the talk, she insisted that I and John Adams, who was the co-founder of the RC chapter with me, uh, come back to her, her home <clears throat> with a couple other people because she wanted to talk about setting up an AIA chapter in Orange County. <clears throat> it was hard to say no to Norma, as many of you know. So we went and um, I it was a bit weary to tell the truth, but Norma and I hit it off immediately. We ended up after the others left, I lingered on for another hour or so with her. And it was the first of many long conversations with Norma. Over the years, she was, I think, the most civic-minded and public-spirited person that I know. She was so anxious to do things to benefit the world and her community and the areas of interest to her, which were archaeology and particularly the Levant in Israel. And we talked at length about the many things that she wanted to do, uh, a garden for the city, a, a library, um, she sponsored a conference room for RC in Cairo, <clears throat> the auditorium at the Bowers Museum. The contributions went on and on, and she became a member of RC, and subsequently we put her on the board of RC for a number of years. I spent a lot of time talking with Norma. I as she, her health was declining and she was bedridden, I talked with her every week. And she talked about the things that she had done and the things that were meaningful to her. And of the various things that she did, I think the two that she took the most pride in were the two professorships that she set up at UC San Diego and at UCLA. I think this gave her more gratification than any of the other things that she had done. And so I think it's particularly fitting that today we have one of those professors here to speak to us, <clears throat> Dr. Aaron Burke, got his um, undergraduate degree at Wheaton College and then his PhD at the Oriel Institute in Chicago. 
He has worked extensively through the Levant and particularly concentrated on the area of Jaffa. And today uh, he is going to talk with us about his work there. He currently is the Kershaw Chair of the Ancient Eastern Mediterranean in the Department of New Eastern, Near Eastern Languages and Culture at UCLA. And his talk today will be on the Egyptian rule and Canaanite resistance as seen from Jaffa. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Burke. Thank you, Ben. I'd like to thank Ava, Ben, and Luis, and, and Liska for the invitation and for setting up this opportunity. Um, before I begin, I too want to pay my tribute to um, Norma Kershaw and uh, her um, contributions and support of, um, I hope I'm sharing the right screen, uh, contribution and support of um, myself and uh, archaeology, uh, both in Egypt as well as in the Levant. I know her from having a foot in both uh, areas and being a member of both RC and ASOR. Um, I have spoken in the Bowers Auditorium um, at the, or the Kershaw Auditorium at the Bowers Museum and stood in the garden uh, honoring Norma Kershaw at the Albright Institute in Jerusalem. And it's a great honor um, to have known her. Um, she was likewise, I would say to echo Ava's comments, uh, a mother to myself uh, as an academic here. I got to know her over the 15 years uh, that, she, that she and I overlapped here in LA. And uh, I hope that this lecture is a grand tribute to her. Uh, she took great pride in uh, giving comments and suggestions for which uh, most of us will be grateful to receive those kind of remarks about how to improve our presentations and to reach a greater and greater audience beyond even academics. So I hope today um, what I can share with you from Jaffa is a tribute to her. Uh, she was uh, responsible even before I held the Kershaw chair and Eastern Mediterranean um, studies at uh, UCLA uh, for supporting the project through my colleague, William Schneiderwin in Hebrew Bible, the first holder of the Kershaw chair for 11 years uh, from about 2006, I think it was. Uh, and uh, he supported the project by sending students there and providing direct support. And we dedicated our first volume, History and Archaeology of Jaffa One, uh, to her. And I'm glad she was able to see that uh, during her, uh, her time uh, in the last decade. What I would like to speak to you today about is uh, a somewhat shortened version of a talk that I have given uh, in recent months, uh, including to the North and South uh, California chapters of RC. Uh, this will be a shorter version of it, um, echoing and, and reflecting work uh, supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities in Jaffa that has been carried out from about uh, since about 2001 with NEH support from 2013, um, but also graphs in uh, a great deal of earlier excavation research going back to 1955 in Jaffa um, the earliest excavations um, carried out uh, by the municipality of Tel Aviv that were never published. Um, much of what you'll see today is uh, included uh, within our first major excavation report within the American Journal of Archaeology uh, by the AIA uh, that was published in 2017. It's open access, so I hope that if you're looking for more details from an academic side of things, you can look there. Um, there are also some public articles uh, that feature digital modeling of the site, uh, some of which I will feature today um, and uh, be glad to answer some questions afterwards about uh, the results of this work. I titled this talk, Egyptian Rule and Canaanite Resistance as Seen from Jaffa, uh, because one of the leading things that we were able to conclude from our excavations and study of the old results from excavations in Jaffa is that it uh, as an Egyptian fortress faced over the course of uh, 350 years or more, um, new, uh, periodic resistance, uh, and, and it sort of becomes a witness to periodic resistance to Egyptian New Kingdom rule in Canaan. And so um, that's sort of the leading narrative that one can take away, and one of the points that can be interrogated from the archaeological context 
in Jaffa. And what we'll look at today principally is not the whole arc of that 350 years, which takes quite a bit to digest and is more like an hour long lecture, but we'll look at the period uh, post Amarna period from about 1300 to uh, almost to 1100 BC uh, that features uh, episodic resistance um, that I think can be pointed to coming uh, principally from the coastal plain of Canaan. Uh, that is um, the uh, coastal territory of what is today Israel and uh, perhaps even into the Gaza Strip. Okay, without further ado, let's situate you a bit. I presume that everyone knows where Tel Aviv is at the Eastern Mediterranean uh, in the central coast of Israel. And Jaffa is one of those classic uh, settlements uh, uh, or, or communities located on the south side of a modern city that was neglected. And it was in the 1990s when um, sort of a, an effort to revive it sort of gave it greater and greater attention. Now there was earlier archeological work uh, but it was really since the 1990s that uh, excavations in and around uh, Jaffa itself and the lower city that's all boxed in and red here um, really gave it an opportunity to shine as an archaeological site. There's a, a glaring omission in studies of the region through the Bronze and the Iron Age uh, for um, before 2000 in most of the bibliography and uh, Jaffa uh, has something to say about all of that and today we're going to focus on that period in the New Kingdom. Now Jaffa first enters into the story of Egyptian New Kingdom, not in the earliest moments before Tutmosis III, but really from the reign of Tutmosis III on. And that is in year 23, following um, his uh, defeat of this large Canaanite coalition in what is commonly referred to as the Battle of Megiddo, where he catches unawares this large coalition around 1456 BC. And it's in the wake of that, that we receive through the documentation of the Bark Shrine of Amun at Karnak uh, that belongs to Tutmosis III, a long list of, I think, what is most fairly characterized as conquered towns. Number 62 on this list is a place that had been historically, you know, or epigraphically omitted up to this point. And that is a Canaanite town known as Yapu in Egyptian, probably something like Yafo or Yafe uh, in Canaanite and ostensibly meaning beautiful, fair, nice place. A colleague of mine working on the harbor question has suggested that it probably referred to a fair anchorage. Uh, and that's not something I'll be able to get into today, but we've done some studies and are working on a, an, uh, a large journal article that documents to the east of the site, the location of what we think is now a silted up harbor that would have provided a protection uh, for ships from the Bronze Age, you know, Canaanite period until the New Kingdom when it became a logistical and uh, maritime center for the Egyptian empire. So it's really from this moment that we can expect to see an Egyptian presence here. And indeed the archeological report not only confirms that there's no destruction of the site that we can attribute to the Egyptians, suggesting that indeed through the conquering of this coalition and Jaffa in particular, Jaffa enters into Egyptian control, but it's also uh, something that I'm going to neglect to talk about now is the earliest evidence that is present uh, that we've published uh, that includes Egyptian ceramics in the 15th century right after Tutmosis III's uh, conquest of the site. It seems that they took over the Egyptian architecture, didn't build in, in particular any Egyptian fortress in that earliest period, and it's not until about 1400 BC that we start to see uh, some architecture of that. And that's what we'll look at today, uh, especially about a hundred years later uh, from 1300 BC in the Ramesside period. So this site is taken over by the Egyptians and becomes a maritime logistical center. Sadly, there's not a great deal of documentation of that whole transition uh, in the Egyptian record. And it really is left up to us to piece together uh, why it should be so important. Now here's an aerial view of the site of Jaffa. The green areas and almost everywhere you see trees are probably fairly the confines of the ancient site or tell. It wasn't until 1936 that what you see now was even uh, what you could properly call a tell because it was a living city. It wasn't a destroyed city, but in a counterinsurgency the British carried out against uh, locals in 1936 during the mandate period, uh, much of the site was destroyed. Uh, we have documentation of that. 
Uh, and by the 1950s, the rubble of these uh, destructions were still there, pushed aside uh, up towards this auditorium you see in this green space, um, that mound of rubble made uh, possible excavations beginning uh, from classical periods down here in what is today a park area. Um, this we call area A, and it features two primary areas. I'll only be talking about one today, that is the so-called Ramses Gate area, named after uh, the chief monument found there that's uh, appended to the large fortified gate, and uh, the Lion Temple, a, a particular building just inside the gateway. So the exposures are not enormous, they're not ideal, uh, but we're probably looking at a fortress of something by something on the order of uh, maybe 200 by 100 meters, uh, some, something on that order, a rectangular structure here that we can look at parallels uh, from the cataract forts uh, for. Now, our focus was excavating in the Ramses Gate area and began uh, with a structure that had been partially exposed. I think you might even be able to see that at one end of the gate complex here in the 1950s that was re-exposed in the 1990s and made this whole area a possibility for excavations. Indeed, as you'll see later on, Tel Aviv University gave its hand at trying to excavate here in 97 and 99 and sort of threw in the towel on those efforts. And we picked them up uh, from our, the start of our project, the Jaffa Cultural Heritage Project in 2007 with first excavations in this area in 2011. Now, there's not a lot we can say about the Amarna period here in the 14th century. Um, but as you can see from my remarks here, uh, after the initial construction of a fortress here after 1400 BC, um, we think that we can determine that there is a destruction line and a rebuilding of that fortress that took place sometime after 1400 BC. Now, whether we can connect it directly to the Amarna period or just generally to the 14th century is a more difficult question and it remains an open problem. But it's really from about 1300 BC when this gate complex is rebuilt that we can begin to talk about in detail uh, from the Ramesside period, uh, what Jaffa was like and what this fortress complex was like and how it might have functioned within the Egyptian uh, imperial apparatus. So here you see uh, what we'll be talking about principally, what a phase we call RG4A, the Ramses Gate 4A phase, a rebuilding that takes place that we can detect um, on this original foundation. Now, those of you who know Egyptian archeology span will find it peculiar that we have a stone foundation here. Um, we often remark Egyptian architecture doesn't use stone foundations. Well, there's a rider to that is if you're an Egyptian building in a place that gets as much rainfall as coastal Levant, you build with stone foundations because your sandy bricks and your traditional brick architecture is not going to uh, survive the erosion and uh, the rot basically uh, that will be incurred in a coastal environment. So um, they did adapt to local uh, circumstances, even though very early on their bricks do emulate uh, Egyptian practices or persist in carrying that on. So let's look in more detail here from about 1300 BC, uh, what we call the gates rebuilding phase. Uh, so we had that initial construction around 1400 re reacting to the fact that Egyptian, uh, that uh, Jaffa needed to be um, sort of bulwarked against Canaanite resistance. At some point in the 14th century, I'm suggesting uh, by my reconstruction lines there that something happened that required some rebuilding. I think you can see it here uh, pretty distinctly in the distinguished uh, steps to the construction uh, that the structure had to be rebuilt around 1300 BC. So we're pointing to already a couple episodes of Canaanite resistance to Egyptian rule. If I give you some lines around the structure as we see it, um, and I apologize that this photograph is a little fish eye like as we took it with a GoPro camera from a quadcopter, um, but trust me that these are the general lines of these towers that were constructed from their original construction and into their rebuilding at 1300 BC. These are about 22 meters in length, almost six meters in width, and if we can reconstruct them at least almost four meters uh, tall in their solid brick construction before the second story, which uh, I think arguably uh, did exist. And we have uh, reconstructed along the lines of other Egyptian fortresses. 
Now, the passageway here is at least uh, four meters wide. So that's a very substantial passageway. And as you'll see today, um, it could not only function to allow easy traffic through, but you could even stuff things in there and carry out activity in the passageway and still manage to consider it a viable passageway. Um, there are ways in which, as I'll point out, this operation of the gate is very analogous to Canaanite and later Israelite practices, namely that gates seem to have a commercial function. They are kind of the uh, Eastern Agora, if you will, uh, in the Bronze and the Iron Age. So this is the reconstruction of the gate after the Amarna period. Um, this neo-Marxist structure, as I like to refer to it, at the eastern end of the gate complex here is a modern feature commemorating the location of the Ramses II portal that I'll talk about here in a moment. And uh, just to call your attention to it, uh, you see the sort of episodes of excavation here. In the 1950s, Jacob Kaplan already hit in his earliest seasons, 1956, um, the upper portions and latest stages of this gate complex. So he knew that you could get to Egyptian material pretty quickly in Jaffa, which was unusual. He, he, he like many others, would have anticipated lots of a classical material atop it, uh, but he got right to it. Then Tel Aviv University came back in 97 and 99, and in 99 excavated much of the western end of the gate here beyond the uh, left line uh, at the end here. Um, but between both of these, um, they seem to have missed some of the best goodies um, that allows us to really reconstruct how this gate functioned. And I'll point out uh, those uh, now. One of the first things we encountered in excavating uh, about the second season, 2000, well, this was in 2013 already as we went through later phases of the gate, um, were the timbers that enclosed the gate passageway. I want you to imagine, and for those of you who've done some landscaping, you have some sense of this. These are the size of um, railroad ties in terms of section. Uh, and all of the sections we had were preserved to at least two meters, meaning that most of them fractured in half because they had to be about four meters across, more than that to go into both sides of the superstructure of the gate. And when we found them, um, you can see this kind of mess. It's like the uh, what's left in your fireplace after you're done burning the wood. Uh, and we had to recover these and we were quite successful in this process, I'm happy to say. Among the things that we discovered was olive wood, cedar and oak. And much to our surprise, despite the fact that cedar would be the ideal timber to run the long, longer boards across, we're finding that actually olive wood dominated. And my uh, suggestion would be that this is repair work that was done over the life of the gate, probably um, just uh, over the course of the 13th and first half of the 12th century. But we do have evidence of cedar of Lebanon that was shipped down the coast. And as I mentioned, we expended great effort to try to recover these intact and to bring them out um, so that we could analyze them. Um, we are working through and are going to be conducting a dendrochronology project with Cornell University and Stuart Manning uh, there and Britta Lorenzen, uh, one of his uh, PhD students who's now graduated. Um, and we will be analyzing these for the kind of environmental information that they can provide and the complete sequence that it permits uh, sequencing of the growth of uh, sort of cedar and other species. So this is uh, holds some great promise, but we'll get to more accurate information about the destruction date here in a few minutes. Now, once we had cleared the base of the passageway, this is what it looks like. Uh, and you can see uh, it's got curbs on both sides to protect the walls. Uh, we found in many places that plaster facing, a mud plaster was still preserved. So you can imagine these are uh, mud brick superstructures uh, with mud plaster, benches or curbs at the base to protect the foundations of the wall, and some kind of early drainage system that might have gone out of use at one point here uh, running down the middle of it. We imagine this whole structure is enclosed as, we, as you can um, probably guess based upon the timbers that we recovered. And I do want to say that with those timbers, we not only recovered the, the beams that ran across, we recovered portions of the planks that run across the beams and Britta Lorenzen was able to identify the pegs driven through the planks that connected the planks to the beams. So the green wood 
uh, pegs. And it's rather astounding that you can get to that level of architectural reconstruction uh, from what we were able to recover here, but nonetheless, we could. Um, when we excavated the floor, and I'll come back to this in a minute, the entire floor was as black as the black patch that you see here, that is burned carbonized material across the entire surface of the floor to several centimeters in thickness. Um, and I'll show you what we were recovered from that context in a minute. Now at the end here, you see this modern reconstruction of the Ramses II portal that was added to the gate at some point after its construction, perhaps uh, at the very moment of its building uh, in the early 13th century. Now, um, what we do have of the gate portal was not recovered by us, but was actually found in secondary context above this by Jacob Kaplan. So in the latest phase of the gate, and I'll end today's presentation, I think, with uh, an image that illustrates uh, one of those in situ. Um, but about 30%, maybe maximally, of this uh, gate facade has been recovered. This was appended to the outside of the gate. And uh, we literally have the uh, passage uh, from the gate descending down the tell and disappearing into the earth. Um, and of course, you would have walked up to this and seen this uh, on both sides of the gateway. It is a traditional uh, titulary of Ramses II, not to be confused with any of the other uh, Ramesside kings. Um, that seems very clear as Kenneth Kitchen and others can cor corroborate. Um, there are traces of plaster in the Kurkar local limestone. It is the worst material ever to build from. Very sandy, it is from the ridges, uh, the Kurkar ridges that are formed and constantly are forming actually. Um, in this environment of uh, water that drains out from the highlands um, and, and comes into the Mediterranean. This is the local building material. As I said, it's not very useful um, and you don't want to um, do a whole lot of heavy uh, supporting with it. But this would have been appended to the facade of the gate, creating this facade and portal. Um, and uh, so far we've detected the colors, um, probably white is for cer certain, a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow in there. Uh, in some of the hieroglyphs uh, that are preserved. Um, so fairly impressive. Uh, and the kind of thing that we know Ramses II did elsewhere in the Levant, including at Byblos uh, with his monuments. Now, when we first began excavations of this destruction debris, as you can see here, we had almost two meters on top of the lowest floor. And in fact, the lowest floor or the, the floor and the gate passageway here is not even uh, visible in this slide. Um, we had the south tower on the left side of the screen collapsing across um, and we were able to recover the edges of 20 courses of brick. So literally the whole facade fell in across the passageway and sealed the destruction debris. Now one of the more interesting things about this was that we have a fairly clean context here on the south side of the passageway uh, in all of this vitrified brick from which we were able to recover this item a uh, five centimeter uh, wide uh, Amenhotep III scarab, which at first, of course, before we had any dating on this, suggested to us the actual date of this destruction, which we were disabused of uh, by radiocarbon dates later on when we discovered that this is some sort of legacy item or uh, a commemorative item that uh, functioned uh, and maybe was even made later uh, as a commemorative item of Amenhotep III. Now, Tel Aviv University, uh, let's see, um, found in 1999 and published a lion hunt scarab of Amenhotep III. These are commemorative scarabs of his um, lion hunts. Uh, I think this one's commemorating the 102nd or something like that. Uh, and these are found uh, throughout uh, the Eastern Mediterranean in different places. Um, and that one probably came from uh, roughly where my arrow is pointing here and the little bit of excavation that they did in this area. Um, and it's a very interesting uh, sort of collection. Uh, for the most part, uh, Amenhotep III and his wife T are the only pharaonic or only pharaohs attested in our scarab evidence to date. Now we know we're probably missing some scarabs that we haven't been able to recover from old excavations, but that's what we have. Um, this scarab, as I mentioned, is about five centimeters across. There you have the reading uh, by one of our former students, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Crystal Pierce. Um, the good God, the Lord of truth is Ra, Lord of appearances, um, this uh, nomenclature attached to uh, Amenhotep III. Now, obviously, with this 14th century date for his reign, we would have assumed that we were looking at an Amarna period destruction, possibly, 
Uh, but in the end, as I mentioned, we were disabused of that. Um, along with this uh, scarab were found uh, over 800 beads, just a fraction of which you see here from an early photo. Other ones that uh, are pierced, uh, items that went on a necklace, which is very interesting to us, um, as well as two smaller scarabs, one of which was found by Tel Aviv University in this area, uh, and uh, this upper one and this smaller fra fragmentary one we discovered. Now, that's very interesting that all of this stuff was found in that one crevasse within this uh, collapsed destruction. Um, our reconstruction is that this fell from a second story and into this uh, crevice. I sometimes refer to this as our Lord of the Rings moment uh, where something is falling out of the hands of uh, uh, this individual or fell from their office down into this spot. There's no ceramics, there's no other material uh, in this particular spot to indicate that it came from a floor or the lower story which would have had to be in the passageway. This fell from above, and this leads us to suggest that this upper story is an administrator's office. Now, from the passageway itself, we have a number of really fascinating discoveries, including um, this one only restored uh, as of 2017, uh, several years after its excavation. Uh, it is a, an ivory box inlay of um, the Egyptian vulture. Um, and it's perfectly flat, so it very clearly seems to have been inlaid in a box. Um, we recovered no other fragments of ivory to suggest that this box was, you know, exceedingly elaborately decorated. Uh, it seems to have had this one placard. Um, whether or not this fell from the upper story or was downstairs in the passageway when it collapsed um, is a little bit difficult to say. Um, but I'm always um, tickled by the fact that the um, one of the best parallels for this comes from the back of Tutankhamun's throne. Uh, and you can see um, the rendering uh, there of this um, uh, vulture. Um, although to me, this looks like the head of uh, the Horus Falcon. But um, in any event, uh, this is perhaps uh, one way of envisioning this, that this was part of either a furniture or the back of uh, or a uh, side of a box, although I think a box makes more sense. Um, and it's a fairly small uh, element. A lot of ceramics were recovered from the passageway, including things like this large Cypriot store jar that was uh, excavated by Jacob Kaplan in 1956. Um, we found the actual depression out of which it came and that allowed us to re-contextualize it within the passageway. So you have to imagine that this 1.5 meter uh, jar is off to the side of this four meter wide passageway and consequently there was quite a bit of activity there along with uh, Mycenaean imitation vessels like the one you see in the upper left here, uh, lamps of what are mostly a Canaanite style although made in Egyptian style fabric, um, don't have any reason to believe that the lamps here were produced were radically different, and the very ubiquitous Canaanite store jars of which we have numerous examples um, that are smashed in the passageway as well as this uh, many, many Egyptian style bowls in local production. Now, maybe more interesting than all of that, uh, ceramics, and I know archeologists love to talk about ceramics. I might be one of the ones who has a greater aversion to it than others, um, but I find uh, quite fascinating um, that we have uh, from the passageway uh, more than, I think the latest count was more than 35,000 seeds. Um, recovered from all of that black organic material that was upwards of, you know, three to 10 centimeters deposited across the passageway. And again, I remind you that this dark patch uh, stain really of uh, charcoal uh, that we couldn't get off there um, really covered this entire passageway. And what you see on the left here is uh, a little close up of some of that, um, what I think is the um, barley in this case uh, from the floor. But here's the list of, uh, of vegetal matter for which we have seeds um, that indicate something of the diet of those who were inhabiting the fortress and perhaps nearby. Barley, wheat, olive, grape, chickpeas, lentils, legumes, um, broad beans, uh, vetch, pistachios, uh, and that's what we're able to identify and, and after an extensive analysis um, uh, by our botanist. Um, I'll never forget the moment where um, at the end of the season we were sifting through the seed material back at the lab and one of our undergraduates with the tongs picked up and said, 
I think this is a chickpea. <laughs> and indeed, it was so carbonized and so clear, it looked to have been poured out of a can. It just happened to be black and you wouldn't want to eat it, but it looked exactly like a chickpea. So that was the first identification we got, and it didn't take a botanist to figure it out. Um, so this impressive collection of seeds, however, not only allows us to talk about the diet and the possibility that what is largely looks like a Canaanite diet was also the diet by um, the 12th century uh, of those who were inhabiting the fortress, and that this passageway may have been functioning as a kind of open marketplace between the community inside the fortress and nearby, nearby uh, communities. Um, but what is fascinating about this collection that I'll get to in a moment is the ability to date the destruction fairly accurately. Now, along with those seeds in the passageway and those various vessels that indicate a degree of market activity, we had a pile of antlers. And I think the ultimate count was over 50 individual antler sets, some of which had been cut, others of which were uh, largely broken in the piles that they uh, were located here along the passageway. Um, and um, from, from this, we suggest that these were being marketed or sold or distributed in a way that they could be used as tools. I'm not actually sure of all the ways in which this might have been used, but you could use them from burnishing uh, things and, and maybe even in relationship to textile. I'd love any comments or suggestions about how those might have been used, even if the parallels come from um, other contexts like European archaeology. Uh, but you can see here uh, just some of those fragments. So this is a fairly impressive uh, collection, which sort of is you know, completely unexpected in this context. Um, as I mentioned and alluded to, we interpret the context here of finding all of these things along the passageway floor as suggestive of a marketplace. While we have some items that have fallen from above, uh, like the necklace of Amenhotep the, with the Amenhotep III elements, um, it seems pretty clear that most of the stuff sitting on the passageway was there when the destruction occurred and not brought into this context. And that what we're seeing here is the functioning of this Egyptian gate complex in a late stage of New Kingdom Empire as a marketplace uh, where exchanges were occurring not only between Egyptians and, the, and their agents, but also local populations like the Canaanites. So we have an interesting balance here between periodic resistance by certain factions in the coastal plain against Egyptian rule as evidenced in the destruction of Jaffa, um, foiled against interaction in a peaceable way as a result of, um, as reflected, uh, in the kinds of remains that suggest a marketplace in the passageway. And here you see the chickpeas, pile of chickpeas. They didn't go right into this bowl, but the bowl was found nearby, as were others. Um, and we have elements uh, that might suggest uh, game boards or um, inlays and boxes. Um, these uh, in the lower right made of bone. Uh, a few fragments of, um, of foil. And one of the notable things about those few, few pieces of foil was from the folds of one of them, we actually have textile that's being analyzed by the Israel Museum that we um, suspect is linen, uh, which would point to the kinds of uh, things that would be more common to Egyptian garb and dress perhaps than they would be to Canaanite. But that of course is entirely negotiable in the context of uh, the 12th century. Now, as I mentioned, having all of the seed material is very significant and it's principally important for one major reason. When you get short-lived samples of seeds that reflect a short duration from harvest to consumption, barley, wheat, olives, you don't want to keep them around too long. Um, they might be good for seed, but you want to eat them when they're fresher. So most of this stuff, when it comes to short-lived samples, are assumed not to have been around very long. And in that case, if you test seed samples and you can tell as we can that our tens of thousands of seeds belong to a sealed deposit and a moment in time, then ideally it's able to suggest to you the actual moment of destruction or very close. Given a margin of error of plus or minus 15 years, which is something that is possible with the University of California's Irvine Keck uh, AMS lab, as you can see, most of our dates were run with them. We were able to determine that this destruction of the Ramesside gate constructed around 1300 BC first took place, or this phase of the gate took place in 1135 BC. 
So we have a fairly long-lived gait of about 150 years, evidencing maybe one of the longer periods of uh, peace or at least lack of resistance, I think is a fair expression, um, during the entire time that the Egyptians controlled the site. This is significant because up to this point in Levantine archaeology, we have bandied about mostly a, a date of 1130 BC for the end of Egyptian empire, and this mostly based upon one item, a pen case of Ramses VI found at Megiddo, uh, probably in a secondary context. This is pretty lousy evidence for a precise date, and I'm happy to say that after all of our efforts and uh, Kaplan's efforts, we're able to suggest uh, pretty clearly a date around 1135 BC. Now, I will only trouble you with one more, one or two more slides to point out that this is not the end of the story in the Egyptian fortress, that we actually have a very short-lived phase, uh, perhaps upwards of about 10 years. Um, and one of the reasons we can be pretty confident about the 1135 date that we're suggesting here is that it's bracketed by yet another sealed context uh, that provided uh, short-lived carbonized samples uh, dated to 1125. Now, before I get to that final moment, I just want to point out who do we think destroyed Jaffa? Because this is perhaps our greatest contribution in looking at Jaffa in the long array is to be able to look at this question and answer it and suggest that local resistance is largely the reason that Egyptian empire uh, seems to be sort of devolving. Obviously, there might be problems back in uh, Egypt that led to the decline of Ramesside rule as we went from Ramses III to the 11th. Uh, but as it concerns material ability to resist Canaanite uh, insurgency, uh, that declines over time. And 1135 becomes the first of a series of at least a couple destructions in Jaffa, bringing about the end of Egyptian rule. Um, we don't have any evidence to suggest the Hittites on my la uh, list here on the left, so we can pretty much remove them from candidacy for this. Sea peoples are usually seen as early 12th century uh, uh, culprits for destruction and uh, disruption of sites. They don't really make any sense in this context. Israelites have almost no narrative that brings Jaffa into their conquests or their overall uh, story from 1200 on, depending on when you set that tradition. Um, so they don't seem to be viable candidates, leaving us ultimately with local Canaanite resistance, a long and enduring story in the coastal plain, um, which we have tracked back all the way to uh, the late 15th century. So I think that that's fairly easy to say, although it may have had support from other uh, quarters, I don't think it really needed it. Um, what mostly uh, occurred was sort of coalitions of resistance forming around uh, different population centers. Now, as I mentioned, the gate is rebuilt and the plan is resurrected to on top of two meters of destruction debris to exactly the same dimensions and standards of the prior structure. The brick size changes a bit. It corresponds with a very late Ramesside uh, episode of construction in Jaffa and at other sites with a smaller uh, brick. Uh, it's made of gray brick, which indicates it's being, they're using ashy material, which is kind of a, a telltale sign that something has happened from which they're taking this uh, material to, be, to make these bricks out of. But nonetheless, this is resurrected uh, out of the ground uh, in exactly the same dimensions. That had to be a staggering setback or frustration to Canaanites um, in this moment uh, when they thought that they could topple Egyptian rule. Um, and we're not sure precisely which pharaohs we're talking about here between 1135 and this second phase of destruction in the second half of the 12th century that we date to 1125 BC, but they were able to resist one more time. And from these photos from 1956, Jacob Kaplan captured this moment. You see this Ottoman or British Mandate period pipe that ran down a street that lined up directly with this Egyptian passageway sitting directly on top of the threshold of the final gate here. You even see the doorstop that it's butted up against. This is the threshold on the outer part of the gate complex. And here off to the left is one of what would have been two gate hinges. This thing weighs about 60 pounds of solid bronze. You can even see in the color photo, one of the few that we have from his excavations, 
a couple of the nails that held the uh, beam that must have, or the uh, boards of the door that must have been at least 15 centimeters in thickness. Uh, so these two panels of doors. And note, please, that the door is in the closed position. So when this fortress was besieged uh, and destroyed and burned in situ, and this was not rediscovered to be recycled, um, it was left there and it, it echoes that final moment of destruction uh, by the Canaanites at around 1125 or in some uh, moment thereafter. This final date can slide a little. It could go as late as 1100 BC. I'm not opposed to that idea. I doubt very much it goes all the way to the end of the New Kingdom to 1075, um, but there is a uh, more protracted and uh, violent uh, and uh, sort of chaotic end to the Egyptian empire here than I think we've been playing with. Um, and I'm hoping that in the years to come, as uh, many excavate other sites, uh, that we'll be able to tease out a more nuanced understanding of this unraveling of Egyptian empire and what it meant, uh, not only for Egypt, but also for the communities um, that then uh, carry on afterwards, because it's in the 11th century that we see the rise of the story of um, Israelite monarchy. Uh, and I think, in, to my mind, and reconstructions, and this as a sort of next phase of research uh, is a fascinating connection to uh, try to explore further. Um, with that, I, I would like to thank you for your time. Um, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. I might even pull up some slides to illustrate um, other aspects of our work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. And I just want to direct if anybody does have questions to please put them in the Q&A box and uh, we will address them. Um, we have first two questions um, from Francesco and Jackie that are related. Um, asking about dating the gate to the Amarna period um and if that date is correct might it have possibly been earlier dating to the reign of Amenhotep the second or third that's a great question um i have obviously neglected the discussion of the late 15th century um we have solid uh dating to Tutmosis the third and Amenhotep the second on the basis of ceramics dated to the end of the 15th century um, and based upon the destruction of Jaffa, or, or sorry, uh, the counterinsurgency that Amenhotep II references, I think it's year seven, against Afek, only 20 kilometers away, I would suggest that the destruction of Jaffa around, four, you know, in the late 15th century, which we have attested and I didn't talk about today, is, um, is, is, is solid evidence um, with that ceramic evidence that we have an Amenhotep the second phase. What is problematic for us in Jaffa, and it's really a problem throughout all of Canaan, is identifying ceramic and material culture hallmarks of the 14th century. I'm now working with a, a PhD student who's finishing his uh, degree here at UCLA, Jacob Dom, and we cannot put our finger on clear ceramic markers in all of the material that we have from Jaffa for the 14th century. So consequently, when I suggest the destruction there in that one slide of the gate complex at the in, in the 14th century, maybe the Amarna period, it is by proxy in sandwiching between the clear destruction attributable around the time of uh, Tutmosis III, Amenhotep II, probably Amenhotep II, and the rebuilding in 1300 BC by, by Ramses II. Um, so, it's a problem, um, it's a challenge, one that's gonna take more than what we have in Jaffa to, to answer. So I, did, I, did I answer that? <laughs> I think you did, yeah. Uh, by the way, just a comment. Uh, Shireen commented on the horns of animals, although from China and Indonesia are used medicinally. So another interesting context. As a yes. zooarchaeologist, I find it fascinating. So yes, we could yes. talk for a while about that. <laughs> um, Great a question on the origin of the wood. Um, where is it from? 
Uh, the cedar of Lebanon has to be from cedar, uh, from Lebanon, sorry, <laughs> it is cedar. Um, that has to have come from Lebanon because it only grows at an altitude of over 3,500 meters, I think it is. So it has to be quite high up. Um, the olive trees and any kind of oak fragments had could come from inland. They would have been hauled a distance, but that's not too radical to suggest. Um, there's always the possibility that some of these things, uh, maybe the oak, might have been recycled from ships, I guess, um, but more than likely it just comes from inland. This was a swampy environment, um, kind of miserable, frankly. I can only imagine how uh, humid and swampy and bug infested and malarial um, the entire region was along the coast here. Uh, you had to go inland uh, a fair bit. And we think that swamps and this um, anchorage, enclosed anchorage, um, off to the east of the site were what made it a, a good harbor town. Uh, a question on if there are any estimates as to the number of people lived um, in the fortress. Yeah, um, if we use typical um, metrics for total hectares, meaning a hectare being 100 meters by 100 meters area, um, and if we're conservative, we say 100 persons per hectare, then a fortress like this, you know, could have held 250 people. But of course, it could be more dense than that because it's a fortress. Um, there also might be a fair number of people who operated in the fortress or in relationship to it who lived in the immediate hinterland. Um, but I'm not, I'm guessing that the fortress at any given moment only had several hundred troops in it. Um, that we don't have to envision a large garrison here. We have to think about this as a logistical center more than a stronghold intended to uh, provide uh, large resistance in the region to um, anything like Canaanite insurgency or resistance to the Egyptians. Um, that was something that was um, levied on an annual basis through these episodes of, of Egyptian campaigning. And that's, and that's really important to the whole interpretation is you know, when you think about those moments of Egyptian campaigning, this was not something done just to be done. It was done because it was viewed as strategically necessary by the Egyptians. And many of the places to which they returned on more than one occasion um, evidence the level of resistance that they faced in the countryside. The coastal plain was the most densely area, um, inhabited area of Canaan. Uh, the highlands much less densely so. And so the resistance made sense to come from places like Afek, uh, 20 kilometers away, Gezer on the road to Jerusalem, Ashkelon uh, down the coast. Uh, uh, another question from Daniel. Uh, many thanks for the lecture and the Basel article. How do you know that the Egyptians were still controlling Jaffa at 11.35. Couldn't the Egyptians abandon the town earlier before the destruction, especially if you have additional destructions in 11.25? Finkelstein and others claim the Philistines entered the Southern Levant later, uh, that Papa. common opinion. How do you regard his suggestion? Well, um, you know, I think we have to deal with what we're looking at, you know, on face value. Um, in the context of the other, you know, I don't think that the other, um, context from south of here for Philistia have much to say about this context, except for the fact that after all of the destruction of the site and what seems to be in an abandonment after 1125 or maybe as late as 1100, we do have some pits um, and there is some Philistine ceramic in them. Not a lot and nothing to suggest a robust phase of habitation. This looks to me like um, opportunistic settlement we know that Tel Kassila, just to the north of us on the Yarkon River, becomes the boundary of Philistine expansion in this uh, period before 1000. Um, so I would argue that the nexus of information we have from Jaffa itself, from architectural styles that are Egyptian, especially with the rebuilding of the fortress. I mean, this is not um, higgledy-piggledy. This is really built to Egyptian standards and conventions and with a high degree of care in each of the rebuilding episodes. I would suggest that it happens without hiccup um, in each of those cases. So this isn't like somebody figuring out what to do 
Um, this is the survival of Egyptian um, uh, resistance to Canaanite resistance. Um, the architecture, the ceramics that are um, all fitting comfortably into the assemblages of Egyptian uh, sites, whether it's Dar el Bala in Gaza or Tel El Borg in the North Sinai, where I had the good fortune to work one season, um, or too. else, yeah, okay, <laughs> or, or, or else um, at any of these sites. So the fact that it looks a little hybrid is not surprising. It's certainly fascinating. Um, and it's not a suggestion that somehow we've lost, uh, that these are not Egyptians in terms of um, political power. Um, I do think it is, it is particularly significant with respect to local interactions. And it does suggest um, a very colorful, complex environment at the end of Egyptian empire, one that transitions in a very interesting way uh, into what comes afterwards, uh, albeit from the biblical side of things, almost mute uh, with respect to Egyptian empire. I think on a, on a similar note, there's a question about um, other Canaanite cities um, as far as destruction around the same date. Well, this is an interesting issue because many of these excavations that were conducted previously do not afford a very accurate dating of their actual destruction dates. In fact, the ceramic chronologies would have left many destructions either in the 13th century or early 12th century um, with little regard to their dating this late. In fact, you saw in my radiocarbon dates that there were some OX dates. Those were Oxford dates intended to corroborate the dates that we got from the UC, or to test, I should say, the UC uh, Irvine dates, because we were, you know, sort of smacking ourselves in the head, surprised that these dates were as late as they were. Um, and in the end, I think what it exposes is that we've done so little radiocarbon dating of late Bronze Age context outside of, say, uh, recent excavations at Megiddo. Um, there's been very few late Bronze Age sites that have been excavated and very few uh, uh, within that that have provided uh, radiocarbon dates. So it is a point that requires a full reappraisal, and it is something to which I will be dedicating the next few years of my life. Um, to look at. Uh, some other destruction and other nearby site questions. Um, one is about the nearby site of Tel Garissa, if there's any relation, and then on the destruction, um, asking if there was any evidence of weapons or military activity. Tel Garissa um, had some earlier excavations. It has had some more recent ones uh, that are now being published and worked up by some students from Tel Aviv University. Um, there you have uh, what looks to be one of these sort of Egyptian estate type buildings. Um, we even have one that I didn't get a chance to talk about that we at least have what looks to be the footprint of it. No floors, living floors to go with it um, that Kaplan was able to expose. Um, but at Garissa, which is only a few kilometers to the northeast, in fact, Napoleon set up his cannons and shelled the Ottoman garrison at Jaffa from Garissa to the northeast. So that gives you some idea that it's not very far away, even though it's hidden in the buildings of Tel Aviv. Um, there just seems to have been a, a small uh, sort of agricultural estate, maybe akin to what you see at Afek. So, you know, the fact that these small Egyptian enclaves can live at these sites suggests how strongly most of the time Egyptian control sort of uh, dominated uh, and administered this region. Uh, they didn't need big, big bulwarks uh, at most of the sites at which they were uh, inhabiting. Uh, there is a question about ancient Egyptian accounts about their defeats. Yes. And they wrote about them. Yes, well, I mean, this is a sort of bigger challenge in dealing with imperial and military history in any period. Your primary records are those belonging to the empire that kept a record. It was more or less like a list of grudges and places to make sure that you went after and your successor guaranteed still fell within your control. So what is of course not mentioned, uh, and I think the best case in point with regards to Jaffa is what I didn't talk about, but I've written about elsewhere, is a famous story, although it dates the actual uh, manuscript to uh, the Ramesside period called the tale of the capture of Jaffa. And this is probably set 
at the end of the 15th century in the reign maybe of Amenhotep II, Tutmosis III, um, I actually think it is echoing um, the circumstances that led to the first loss of Jaffa by the Egyptians that then led to a retaking of the fortress through a ruse um, that is uh, by this uh, commander Jehuti, uh, who at least if it's the same person seems to be a historical figure whose tomb was excavated in the 1800s and uh, now all of his stuff scattered all over European and uh, museums, even the Met. Um, but I think it's a true story um, illustrating this uh, sort of uh, periodic resistance uh, that the Egyptians faced and their reactions to it. Um, trying to remember now where, where this question started. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I got Zoom tunnel vision. <laughs> I think it's about Egyptian accounts of their defeat. So I think you have to work basically by inversion and think about all those campaigns as reactions to resistance. And you have to create the shadow on the wall that was the original resistance that is now missing uh, from any kind of historical documentation. Maybe it was never really recorded. Um, so the concern is you know, to put down resistance and by, um, by proxy, we can detect resistance. I think we have to infer that it was present in many cases, not all, but most. Uh, have a question from Daniela about Ellen Morris has identified for the mid 18th dynasty Tel El Ajul and Megiddo as Egyptian bases in Canaan, pointing out the possibility of Gaza, Jaffa, Beth Shan, and, and Akko also to be identified as such. Based on the destruction level that you have mentioned, dated from the reign of Amenhotep II. Uh, do you think we have enough evidence to suggest that Jaffa might have been an Egyptian center during that period? Uh, yes, um, during the period from when to when? I mean, basically for most of uh, the same period. I mean, Jaffa has the earliest evidence. Again, it wasn't the focus of my emphasis today, but it has, uh, along with Beit Shan, the earliest Egyptian ceramics that are detectable um, anywhere so far in Canaan for a uh, firm Egyptian administrative presence. Um, yes, uh, Ellen, I'd like to give a shout out to Ellen. Um, as of a couple of years ago, Ellen and I are now trying to collaborate on uh, sort of Jaffa 2.0, as <laughs> perhaps we could call it, uh, which is the what happens after Jaffa with respect to Egyptian and Canaanite interactions because I think one of the more fascinating things is to imagine that not everybody went home with the Egyptian empire. There were Egyptians that we are very well aware married locally. Um, the, we see hybrid burials in anthropoid sarcophagi of Egyptian officers or administrative officials um, married to, you know, I think for lack of a better term, Canaanite gals and had children, you know, together. So these individuals don't necessarily pick up and go home but rather they're a part of this, you know, what you might call in the Bible mixed multitude um, that make up the population of Canaan after uh, the demise of Egyptian rule. But by far Jaffa, uh, I list it among uh, the Chetem fortresses that uh, Ellen identifies. Uh, I think she explicitly called, suggested that it could be so um, in her earlier work. Um, and for sure, it's got the same assemblage that Beit Shan has um, that um, might permit it to be labeled as such uh, from an early date from the 15th century, right after Thutmose's III. And actually, there is a question from Ellen that came through on the chat uh -oh. um, in reference to your just, uh, 1125 discussion. Yeah. <laughs> um, how have you distinguished an Egyptian rebuilding from a possible rebuilding by those who could have conquered the fort? Okay, I dropped out a couple of slides here for the sake of brevity and <laughs> respect for all of your time. Um, but there, in, in that um, in the 2011 season, 2011-2012, we were able to get to that last Egyptian gate that connected with <laughs> Kaplan's uh, threshold and the gate uh, hinge that he had recovered. Um, and we excavated further in and picked up the subfloor of that. We've got bricks of a gray uh, type uh, and dimension that are classically um, the latest period of Egyptian construction as attested at other sites. So 
there's not much question to my mind that this should be connected with Egypt as well as, you know, uh, a scarab, uh, just a sort of decorative scarab found from the floor and continuation of the Egyptian assemblage, including an Egyptian cup. Um, and so I don't see any reason here to suggest that this was uh, taken over and redeployed. I guess there's nothing that proves that it can't be, but um, to my mind, the long and enduring um, uh, continuation of this tradition uh, with no evidence, at least in Canaan, that uh, these fortresses are being uh, for any great duration inhabited by Canaanites. Although I guess you could say the tale of the capture of Jaffa illustrates that they took over sites and then um, um, and then um, Egyptians had to recover them from them. So it's totally within the realm of possibility um, and it might be part of the messy end of Egyptian control. Uh, but uh, as far as we can tell, the architectural styles look like they adhere to Egyptian conventions. I think we'll take one more question for okay. time. Um, a question from Cynthia that is this picture really one more of colonization than conquest? Well, you know, our terminologies don't always fit well real world environments, right? I mean, we, we think of colonization and we have a very formal approach to what that means. Imperialism and colonialism and military expansion like this, um, you know, was uh, Russia's takeover the Crimea, Crimean uh, colonization? We don't often use that word, but in, you know, in some sense you could say it's sort of that. Um, and so I think we have to think of these things on um, in a sort of fluid way. Um, I often think about Egyptian empire as a net being thrown over Canaan rather than an ink blot on a map. Um, and a lot of stuff gets through a net, um, the finer, smaller things do. Uh, it gets very difficult to have total control over things. And what you find yourself having to do if you're the Egyptians is to constantly come back and rethink your strategy. One thing that's very clear over the duration of the Egyptian empire is that by the time we get to the 13th and 12th centuries, the Egyptians have a strong foothold. They are creating um, sites like Garissa and Afek with rural agricultural estates and administrative centers that clearly mean they have eyes, ears, and a hand um, in many, many places where previously they might have gone with a more loose administrative structure. So there's an evolution to empire that doesn't allow it to be easily explained by a single label. In fact, um, I think that there, although Ellen did a lot of that early work uh, with respect to the historical questions, I think we constantly have to work back and, and recall that it's not even clear that there was a footprint for empire before Tutmosis III. And it's questionable after Tutmosis III what anyone had in mind about what it was they were trying to accomplish or what they would have said is acceptable versus unacceptable, except when someone threw off Egyptian rule and said, we're not gonna pay tribute anymore and we're not gonna abide by this. That was something that had to be met uh, with resistance by the Egyptians if indeed empire was going to mean anything. So I think it's one of those things that's um, fluid, I think uh, it's fair to say over the course of many centuries. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. Uh, I also want to thank Ava Kirsch and Ben Hare for also joining us today uh, for this lecture in honor of Norma. And I'm sure she also would have loved to uh, I'm sure she's heard you many times, and I hope that this is a fitting tribute to her. So thank you all for joining us, and have a good day. Yes, thank you very much, and a tribute to Norma. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.